Good morning and welcome. Welcome to Silk Life Online. It is great to have you with us. Uh, we are starting a new series this morning, a series on prayer. Prayer being this central element to the Christian life. And I want to kick us off with one of my favorite passages. It might be something that you know very well. It might not be. It might be completely new to you. Um, but here we go. It's from Romans, Romans chapter 8, and it's a beautiful declaration from the writer Paul in a letter to the early Roman church. And he says this from verse 15, you did not receive a spirit of slavery. Some of you might have listened to our Exodus uh, series and, and, and have a fresh understanding of what Paul is referencing there in terms of part of their heritage was, was being a people of slavery. So he's saying you're not, you're not to go back to that sense of being slaves. You're not to fall back into fear. It's a very scary, vulnerable place for your life to be run by somebody, particularly a Pharaoh-esque character who is cruel and merciless. So we're not, we have not received the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but we've received a different spirit, the spirit of adoption as sons. And through that spirit, we cry, Abba, Father. And the spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we're children of God. And if we're children of God, then we're heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. Provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. It's a beautiful passage that I come back to again and again and again to fuel me and realign my perspective. And this passage makes several fundamental statements about who we are. Firstly, and perhaps most obviously, that we are adopted children of God. And because we are children, we call him Abba, Daddy. And as children, we are heirs of God. We have an inheritance from our father. Our inheritance is actually Jesus's inheritance. We get the same as he gets because this passage calls us co-heirs or fellow heirs, depending on the emphasis of the translation you're reading. Some of Jesus's existence included suffering and so will ours. But Christ was also glorified. He rose from the dead. He was vindicated, ascended into heaven, experiencing eternal life, access to the throne room of heaven. So this will be our inheritance also. Three little lines in the Bible and so much truth. No longer slaves, but children of God. So fitting that we come to this passage, having just finished a series on Exodus that, freshes, that kind of refreshes our view of the difference between slavery and treasured children of God. Jesus is Lord over our lives. He is God with us, Emmanuel. And this Lord over our lives, if we examine his life, models prayer for us. When he was full of joy, he would pray. When agonizing, distressed, he'd pray. When making major decisions, he would pray. When he appointed the apostles, he spent time in prayer. Jesus was very different to the other religious types who were told uh, stood on the roadside babbling with the intention that they would be seen by others and respected as spiritual or holy. And they went about swooning because they were endlessly fasting. Those that spent time with Jesus seemed to see something a whole lot more intriguing. In fact, his example on prayer was so attractive and inspiring that the disciples came to him and asked, Lord, teach us to pray. Teach us what this actually should look like. Not what we see all around us in culture, but what, what should this actually look like? 
John was one of Jesus's closest friends and he wrote, truly I tell you, the son can do nothing by himself. Think about that for a moment. This means that Jesus depended on the father. In some way chose to depend on the father. For Jesus, everything flowed from his communion with his father. They had been in relationship for eternity and so Jesus had no desire to go it alone. In fact, here we, we celebrate in church salvation in Jesus. We celebrate the good news of Jesus. That's why we're here, right? That's why we sing every week. That's why we sing because words on their own just aren't enough and it's somehow the, the tune gives it extra wings. And we, we're celebrating salvation. We're celebrating good news, the best news ever, but tied up in this good news passage. Jesus is sharing with us his own communion, his own dependence on his father. It's tied up in the good news package. Prayer is learning to enjoy what Jesus had always enjoyed for eternity. And we only get to do it because Jesus shares the privilege of his sonship with us. My kids are super comfortable climbing up on my lap and snuggling in. They have been their whole lives. But if Nick was to climb up on my lap and snuggle in, that would be super odd. I like Nick, but he isn't my son. He doesn't have access to me in that way. In fact, he doesn't even want to have access to me in that way, not ever. But through Christ, we are adopted as children of God, adopted into his family. And so we have access to the Father, free access. Access to the Father in the same way that Jesus had access to the Father for all eternity. Access to the Father that only Jesus had enjoyed now freely opened up to us as adopted children of God. co -heirs fellow heirs what belongs to Jesus shared with us the God of fellowship wants fellowship with us he wants us to argue his promises and character with him because then who he is becomes a more conscious reality for us and we grow as we persist God wants us to know the blessings we experience actually come from him how often in the Old Testament do we see God stop helping the Israel when they're rebellious? Pull him back, should catch their attention, cause them to seek him again. And we see that cycle and we grow as we persist in prayer. You may have a view of God as Lord, judge, distant, remote, stern. But God in truth wants relationship with you. He's friendly even, open-armed, fatherly. He adopted you, chose you, naturally inclined towards you. It's a famous writer, J.I. Packer, who wrote, if you want to judge how well a person understands Christianity, find out how much he makes of the thought of being God's child and having God as father. If this thought is not the thought that prompts and controls his worship and prayers and his whole outlook on life, it means he does not understand Christianity very well at all. Interesting. To know you are a loved child of God protects you from thinking that prayer is somehow a ladder to God. Prayer is not an exercise to earn favor, earn your way up the ladder. Prayer doesn't make you more accepted because you are already accepted. Christ died for you while you were dead in the water because God already loved you. Prayer doesn't make you more loved or more accepted. Prayer is the appreciation that you are loved, the appreciation that you are welcome in the presence of God. You are not chanting out a ritual to gain access. You are already invited you are united to Christ and you are in him and you are a cherished child and your father delights to hear your voice and he doesn't 
doesn't just hear your voice when you're on your Sunday best or when you've had a particularly successful holy day or when you've steered away from temptation and when you've watched your P's and Q's. Actually, John Calvin said that we pray as if through the, the mouth of Jesus. You know, for eternity, the father has always savoured the voice of his son, Jesus. And we're now in Christ. So we, we pray in his name. We pray united with him. We pray in him. We pray with his vocal cords, as it were. In him, your voice will always be welcome to the father's ear. John Calvin also wrote that prayer is the chief exercise of faith. In other words, prayer is the primary way that true faith expresses itself. Others have spun this logic out and come to the conclusion that prayerlessness is in effect practical atheism. Prayerlessness demonstrates a lack of belief in God. If we believe who we are made to be, if we believe we were made by God who loves us, we believe that that God has infinite power, if we believe that God has demonstrated through Jesus that his his commitment to us is unbridled. If we believe that we're children of God and we believe the promises of Bible that we're children of God and, and heirs of God. In other words, everything that belongs to him belongs to us. If we believe in all that. Why would we choose not to communicate with God in prayer? You know, in, in studying for this series, I, I've realized my prayer life reveals how much I actually want communion with God. My prayer life says nothing at all about how secure I am as a child of God. In fact, I could not be more secure because I'm united with Jesus through faith. I'm entirely unrejectable as a child of God. But my inclination for prayer illustrates my inclination to connect or draw near to God. And let me say that's, that's really nobody else's business. It isn't a competition. It should never be a source of condemnation, but it is a helpful reflection. Actually, in life, there are many things that conspire against a fulfilling prayer life because life is busy in many directions. And, and when we do have spare time, we're often tired or distracted. And in truth, the, the devil, he's really happy for us to be busy, tired and distracted. But prayerlessness shouldn't feel like your secret guilty sin. You shouldn't end up kind of crippled by fear that people might know that you missed a day last Tuesday. Prayer isn't a punishment and it isn't brownie points to earn God's favour. The truth, we're probably all naturally inclined away from faith and, and as such naturally inclined away from prayer. We're, we're all sinners. But the good news is Jesus He's the friend of sinners. He likes you and he likes me. And that's a great place to start in a relationship. Let me try and help with a few thoughts. You don't need to fit God into each day. Your prayer life is not something different to the rest of your life. It isn't separate. We saw earlier that Jesus prayed about everything because everything he did flowed out of communion with the Father. Each day is already full of God. Everything we do flows out of the Father. He's interested in every element. And every element can be brought to him in prayer at any moment of any day. Every day. Prayer should infuse many moments of every day. Intuitive breath prayers. Not hyper-spiritual or wordy almost get to the point where it, it isn't clear whether you're praying or working or parenting or what, it just merges. On the flip side, it is good to retreat from the world and shut the door to focus on God and pray. It's very good. One of the best tools you have for inspiring prayer will be the Bible. The Bible points us to Jesus. The Bible is the tool God gives us to see Jesus afresh. When we get a bit blind or foggy to who Jesus really is, it's great, brings us back. 
seeing Jesus afresh, it awakens faith and faith leads to prayer. This gives us a pattern, a basic pattern for our everyday time with God. We fill our minds with Jesus by reading about him. Then prayer is the articulation of our heart's response, our response to the words we've read in the Bible. And also our response to our circumstances, our situation, our emotions and our loved ones. It should all feel quite instinctive and natural over time. But actually, think about it for a moment. Those of you that have attempted to do this retreat, close the door thing. I, I'm aware how many times when I retreat, shut the door, get comfy, settle in. I've made coffee, got my Bible, got my pen, got my pad. And I just find that my mind is spinning, just full of all the stuff I need to do. The things on my to-do list, or actually, more importantly, the things I'd forgotten to put on my to-do list. And sometimes it's helpful just to write those things down as I think of them and put them to one side. But I still find myself getting super frustrated by being distracted by the everyday things of normal life. And I'm supposed to be praying, I'm supposed to be holy on some other kind of spiritual plane or. But then could it be just maybe. That the Holy Spirit is actually the one bringing those things to my mind that the Holy Spirit is bringing them to my mind with the express intention that he wants me to pray about those things. I think maybe God wants you to pray about your to-do list because he wants to do it with you. He wants you to do it quicker and better and more joyfully because he's doing it with you. It's a bit like the, um, the dad that decides he's going to help his kitty out with his science homework. The teacher wanted the kid to make a model of a solar system out of maybe cardboard and plasticine. But come Monday morning, little Johnny turns up at school in the people carrier with a supersized working scale representation of the entire cosmos. Because dad got carried away. God wants to be involved in your nine till five, your front line, your labor, your relationships. He wants to task it with you so pray about every element with him it sounds silly but get his advice because he's really good at creating stuff he's really good at designing and making beautiful things he's good at law and order and community cohesion and social justice he's pretty good with people particularly broken people that require a little bit of extra grace He's good at emotional, physical healing and binding up the brokenhearted. And he's good at setting the captives free. He's good at teaching, good at healing the sick, pretty good at parties, uh, good with food, uh, good at family events. Uh, he's good at pulling something from nothing at the 11th hour. He's good at overcoming impossible odds. And he's good at winning the day when all seems lost. In truth, let him help you out. You can have communion with God at all times and your daddy wants to be involved directly in the things that matter most to you. I visit a lot of houses as part of my day job and I will often stop in my car before I get out and invite God to do that appointment with me. This is one of the privileges of my inheritance is that I can go into an unknown house. I can step over their threshold. And I'm not doing it on my own. In the same way, sometimes I become aware of how I'm feeling inside. A nagging sense of anxiety, a, a, a worry. Actually, in truth, often when I'm tired, I'm way more critical of myself. My, my inner monologue really has a go, you know, it, it kind of reruns old tapes, cringeworthy memories, chronic failures, moment when my mouth ran quicker than my mind. I know you couldn't possibly believe it. Um, and I feel and hear a voice of, of accusation, shame, condemnation. Do you know, in those moments, it's part of my inheritance as an adopted child of God to bring those emotions and thoughts to him in prayer, a little bit like a toddler who falls over and grazes their knee, coming in, I hurt. And so I found myself just the other day, just pausing in my day saying, Father God, 
right now I'm, I'm feeling a sense of anxiety and condemnation, and regret for past mistakes, regret even shame, a sense that I'm not good enough and never will be. But Lord, thank you that that isn't your voice. That isn't your narrative over my life. This is a reaction to being tired and having a lot on my plate. Thank you that I'm your child. Thank you that I come to you as my dad, that you carry this with me, that you speak a different story over my life and that I'm united with Jesus, a co-heir with a rich inheritance. Thank you that you love me and that I'm free from all blame and accusation as I'm in Jesus. Be with me through this day, look after my kids, look after my wife, look after my family. Bless our home, make it a place of joy for us and a place of hospitality and renewal for others. Amen. And then I carry on with my day. All the better for having bought my boo-boo, my current reality, my wound, before the ultimate reality, my Father God. Being a Christian is first and foremost all about receiving, asking and depending. It's when I don't feel needy towards God that actually I'm losing my grip on reality. Maturing as a Christian shouldn't mean I become more self-sufficient. It should mean I become more needy. If we feel our need, then prayer should flow readily. By asking, we exercise that faith muscle. And the more we exercise the faith muscle, the stronger it gets. Not for me to become more independent, but for me to exercise that faith muscle more often, more powerfully, with more satisfaction. We have bought into a father-son relationship. One of asking, just as Jesus did. Depending on the Father, just as Jesus did. Receiving from the Father, just as Jesus did. co -heirs. this is our inheritance. It isn't abstract. It's relational and practical. And relationships grow when you give each other time and focus. Prayer is enjoying that the Father really is the Father. A loving, powerful Father. And instead of being left to a frightening loneliness in a vast world where everything is down to me to make it happen, where I have to make my own salvation, prayer is the opposite of self-reliance. A no to independence, a no to individual ambition, and a yes to relationship with a powerful, loving God. Prayer is the exercise of faith because I need God. And he is my willing father who accepts me in Jesus and through the spirit. Let me close by praying over us the promises of Romans 8, where we started this morning. Father God, Abba, Daddy, Thank you that we have not received a spirit of slavery, that we do not need to be caught up in fear. Thank you that we've received the spirit of adoption as sons. And in that there is liberty and freedom and joy and light of the full. Thank you, spirit, that you bear witness that we are children of God. You declare it and so it is secure. Spirit, we receive you now. Come fill us. We choose to surrender to your presence and power. And I surrender our identity to your narrative over our lives. Thank you that we are children of God. We turn to you now, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, Father. Daddy, Abba. The children of God, we choose to walk in our inheritance, co-heirs with Jesus, through time of struggle, need and suffering, and through joy and peace and blessing. We look forward to sharing in the eternal glory of Jesus through resurrection and the restored creation. Lord, we, we pray this is astounding, remarkable, even shocking truth. Would you minister to our spirits, God? Would you press these truths into our mind, body and spirit and cause us to walk free of all that hinders and entangles? 
Lord, I pray that over my friends this morning. I pray freedom from all that hinders and entangles. And that we would be free to walk in joyful fellowship with you. Every moment of every day, free to walk in joyful fellowship with you. In your name. Amen. It has been great to have you with us. Uh, we're going to be just settling on this topic of prayer over the coming weeks because it is so central to who we are. And it's so important that we, uh, we begin to develop and exercise this muscle of faith and understanding the model of Jesus, understanding uh, how he helps us on this journey. So hopefully you will have found this morning helpful and we look forward to seeing you in future weeks. See you again.